You're listening to Pitch Talks, bringing you the game. Hello and thank you for joining us today on another episode of Pitch Talks. You know the score by now. We're the podcast which gives you insights and advice on how you can work in sport from the people who are living and breathing it every day. Today is no exception, as we welcome James Green, TV presenter, sports reporter and journalist, commonly known for his work on Sky Sports, popular morning shows from Good Morning Transfers. Whilst you'll also learn about how to prepare for these calibre of shows, you'll also get a great message on why it's never too late to change your career. Welcome to Pitch Talks, bringing you the game. So James, thank you for joining us today. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. We'd always like to kick off these episodes with understanding where the passion started uh, for you. Was it something personal from studying sports development at university to getting your first job? What was it about sport presenting that you just wanted to get involved in? Do you know, it was sport in general, to be honest. Ever since I was younger, I was just sports mad. And, uh, you know, if you look back into your childhood, all my childhood memories are sport based, uh, whether that's playing a little bit of snooker on a, a set up snooker table on top of a table or, or tabletop football that you get for Christmas or a little dartboard. Like everything was sport based. Every present I got as a kid was sport based. I just found myself just constantly watching it. What was funny, actually, years and years ago when my my parents moved out of their family home and moved to a retirement home, we went through all my old stuff and there's like old diaries. And in the old diaries, it was just me talking about football. And it's me talking about Paul Merson and Alan Smith. I spelt it with two Fs on the end. Uh, obviously, my spelling wasn't great back then. It probably isn't much better now. Uh, but it, it just showed me what I was like as a kid. I was always sports mad. So whatever happened in my life, I kind of knew from an early age that one thing I wanted to do was work in sport. In what capacity at that point? I had no idea whatsoever. So what was it about being in front of the camera presenting that made you feel like that was the career that you wanted to go down to when you were uh, getting older? Joe, you know it's interesting because I speak to a lot of people in the industry as well and, and so many had a passion for it from a young age and they always kind of saw themselves in front of the camera. That really wasn't me. It wasn't something I aspired to. I didn't think about it, if I'm honest with you. I didn't think whether that would be a job that I would do. I, I never really kind of went down that path, so to speak. Um, and then after... I think I was after university, I'd got a full time job in uh, for Power League Five Side Football Centre. This was just a normal job in a I was a general manager of honestly, guys, I can tell you one of the roughest power leagues known to man. The amount of fights and stuff I saw down there. Oh, my goodness. It was an experience and a half. And I realised quickly I didn't want to be there much longer for the risk of my own safety, I think. Um, but I, I actually years ago I went on a reality TV show. And it wasn't, I didn't go on there to be famous or anything like that. I went on there for an experience and, and I came off this show and loved the experience and then got given a couple of opportunities to uh, go around to a few places and like stand on stage and do some stuff on stage. And then I got some opportunities to host uh, and introduce some bands onto stage. And it was at that point that I started to realize, actually, I really enjoy this. I really enjoy being on stage and actually like hosting and presenting. And I thought, okay, this could be the moment. And it was from there that I started to, I guess, speak to a few more people. I got a few uh, opportunities on some very, very low grade casino shows um, on very popular channels, such as 863 and 869. I think they were, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of it. You would have done um, very, very popular. Uh, or or what happens for most people, they're scrolling up to further channels ahead and unfortunately stop by and stumble on us. But um, um, but that was my first experience in presenting. Uh, and that was it. It was re a really basic show, but it was live. And I was live for six hours a day. And the experience you get from doing that, uh, even though it was, you know, as a show, it wasn't exciting, it wasn't great or anything like that. But the experience of live TV really stood me in good stead. And it, it made me realise that that's what I want to do in the future. That really nicely builds me on to my next point, actually, about talking about uh, your first couple of presenting roles you did. And like you said, entertainment shows and then getting into the sports scene with the International Cricket Council. What was it like for those first couple of roles being in front of the camera and 
How did these experience help you prepare for the future in terms of, you know, skills that you picked up? A good question. It's it's all about experience. And, and something I encourage all younger people to do is, you know, get experience. Well, the great benefit about being young now and aspiring to be maybe in front of the camera now is that you can record yourself anywhere and you've got platforms to put it on. You know, you can put it on YouTube. We didn't have YouTube uh, back when I was started. It wasn't around. So we didn't really have those digital opportunities uh, that you see today. Uh, so for me, it was, you know, building from whatever opportunities I had and trying to just learn and develop while I was there as well. And sometimes I would try new things out. I would um, maybe try to speak to the producer and say, look, I want to try doing this. And that actually gives you more of an insight into how shows run and how shows work. It gives you, I guess, more, certainly more experience on the production side behind the camera as well in preparation to what goes out in front of the camera. So that was really crucial for me. And it's something I've always followed up and always been interested in but yeah so i moved from the casino show i actually moved to itv uh, another roulette show actually uh, ironically uh, so <laughs> bit of an expert in the r- casino world not an expert <laughs> when i go to the casino i might add uh, <laughs> that's for sure many losses uh, back in the day gamble responsibly of course um, <laughs> but the itv one was actually it was nice because that was a that was a nice step up so instead of a six hour live show i was an hour and a half live and you're on ITV. Now, ITV1, regardless of what time you're on, it's still ITV1, and you still at times inherit really big audiences. So that was you know, that was a big step up. <laughs> Ironically, I got recognised more from that than anything else I've ever done in my life. <laughs> the amount of people stop me going, hey, you lost me 20 quid the other night. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not my fault, obviously. Um, so, so, look, I, I was always learning. Um, but the one thing that always you always had to do and I always had to do and still have to do to this day is hustle. You're constantly hustling. You're constantly on the lookout for new work. You're constantly looking to build your client base and to reach out to people. You're constantly monitoring websites to see if people are posting jobs. Um, you know, we're fortunate enough on, say, Twitter, for example. There's certainly a couple of really good people who post media jobs. There's a media mentor and there's a friend of mine, Gary Taphouse, as well, who always posts media jobs. And, and checking all those and all those websites can really help you. And it helped me. I landed a job with uh, the ICC, so the International Cricket Cricket Corporation. Or what is it? Corporation? Council. 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 Oh, my Council. goodness me. Absolute mind blank. Can we cut that bit out? Of course. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Leave it in. Leave it in. Um, yeah, God, goodness me. I went blank then. And I actually got that job, actually, through one of these sites that posted something on Twitter and I applied for it and um, went for an audition and got the job. Now, I got to present and help produce 37 episodes for the Cricket World Cup, which was unbelievable. It was an amazing experience. It was relentless. It was day in, day out, um, literally embracing myself into what was going on within that World Cup to make sure that my knowledge is as far ahead as I possibly can, bring in ideas to the table. We had a really small team. There was only three of us, but it was a fantastic experience. and. And look, what I'd say for the early experiences is, is just it builds your confidence. It builds your confidence for what will hopefully come in the future. Just on that roll quickly, were you stationed out in, in Australia and New Zealand for, for that World Cup? Oh, you had to go there, didn't you? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Do you, know, do you know what? I was devastated. Devastated. Because when I put the job, I, I, I first thought, oh my goodness, am I am I going out there? Am I, this would be amazing. Um no, I was in, <laughs> I was in an off in an office in London, uh, in a basement office in a room that they had a meeting room and they transformed it into a little studio. So sadly, not. Well, uh, ap- apologies for going going there. <laughs> I'm really depressed now. <laughs> to, to, to try and, yeah, to try and move away from that as quickly as we can. Um, <laughs> obviously, you've you've worked in a plethora of different roles in and and out of of the sporting world. I wanted to just sort of see what the biggest difference for you was, or that you'd found from working within sport and and in the, the job roles outside of sport. Really, again, really good question. Um, look, I've worked in a lot of entertainment based shows that. I would say doesn't push you as far, uh, in my opinion. Now, I'm not saying that there there aren't some amazing presenters in entertainment. Of course, there are. You know, look look who's on ITV. You, you Anton Dex, you Dermot O'Leary. They're ut- utterly brilliant at what they do. Um, but entertainment base is, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a knowledge for that subject, so to speak. You know, if it's 
if it's a host in X Factor, okay, they know everything about what's going on in X Factor. But if you're presenting in, say, football, you need to know everything that's going on in football. You can't take shortcuts. And certainly anymore, nowadays, with how social media is, you get found out. And I've seen it before. And I've seen, uh, I won't mention it. I'm not going to mention the guy's name because I don't like to speak down on anyone at all. But he clearly was, it was a young presenter. He had give, he was given an opportunity. Not, again, not his fault because you, you're all taught to say yes to things. Having said that, if you say yes to something and you're on camera, you need to make sure you know what you're talking about because it can really have a detrimental effect uh, to your future. And I watched this young presenter who was known for entertainment-based shows before, and he moved into a specific sport, and he hosted this specific sport, and he clearly didn't know the sport. And it was it was really sad to see, but it really showed how brutal this industry can be, because he's never been back again. Um, it, was, it was car crash, and you can't cheat. Whereas before he probably thought, oh, well, you know, the script will be there. I can just go off kilter and have a bit of fun and stuff with it. But with specific sports and working in sport, you have to know what you're doing. You have to know the sport inside out. And it's such a competitive industry. If you don't know it, trust me, there's somebody else behind you who, who knows more, who's reading more, researching more, spending more time on themselves. And they're ready and prepared to take the opportunity if you don't take it so yeah it was a i think it was a tough lesson there but i think that's the difference for me um that's really i've made the change but i actually enjoy that side and i'm really sad i love my research i i am I, i'm a massive geek and i love doing the research do, do you think it helps that you do have a passion and you've always had a passion for sport that then you can go into that that level of research 100 percent, 100 percent. uh you you the difference is, so for example, if I'm working for a corporate client and I, I have quite a lot of corporate clients and so I'll watch what I say because they're great and I love them and I love what they do, but it's in an industry that I'm really not interested in. So when I'm preparing and learning my script, it's so much more difficult. And when I'm doing the research, it takes double the time. It's a lot harder to do because you've really got to try and almost teach yourself what's going on. Football cricket, it's a joy and I love it. And so like if it's uh, I'm out doing a non-league game or something, I love b picking up the phone, speaking to like the club secretary, having a chat for half an hour, asking him questions about the history of the club and the current state of the club, what's happening off the field as well as on the field. I love it and I get a buzz from it and I find it so fascinating and interesting. So, yes, there is a, that huge difference. And I guess that's what it comes down to. You've got to follow your passion and what you're passionate about. It will come out when you're on camera as well. You're listening to Pitch Talks. James, we obviously mentioned about the some of the gigs that you've done in terms of presenting in the entertainment shows. And we've just done a little bit of comparison there between entertainment and sport. But I want to refer to something that I saw you wrote about, and that was your decision to go back into education and study for an NCTJ in news and sports journalism at the Press Association. What was the driver in this decision? Because you also mentioned about, you know, you had doubts whether it, this was the right thing to do at the point of your career. How did you come to that decision? I'd, I'd got to a time in my life where I was doing more of the entertainment based stuff and I'd been doing it for, I would say about eight years at that point. I was 31 years old and I wanted to do more. And I felt like I had so much more to give, but I wasn't able to kind of, I couldn't find this step. I couldn't find the, how could I get to that next level? Where was it going to come from? Uh, and I, I was probably a little bit naive to think that it will just come. Um, I was probably a little bit lazy as well to think that I could just carry on doing my thing and something will come up. It will be all right. Um, and, and I got frustrated and genuinely I got frustrated with not using my brain as much. Uh, my brain wasn't active. And because of that, it was stopping me from reading more. It was stopping me from researching more and, and trying to develop on myself. So I made the step and, I actually did the course at the same time as uh, BT Sport presenter Jules Breach, who uh, we worked together on an entertainment show for Foxy Bingo, right? Yeah, foxybingo.com. <laughs> it, it was great fun, I've got to say. Um, and there was four of us on that. And one of, one of the presenters, he's now, um, he presents on talk radio. Uh, Jules is obviously now headlining BT Sport score. She's doing absolutely everything. 
Um, and then one of the other girls is on QVC and she does some work with BT Sport as well. So between us, we've all kind of gone on and progressed. It's been a, a nice journey. But but yeah, so back to it. And we, me and Jules spoke and we both were at that point where we really wanted that step up in our careers. And mm. we both felt like we were ready to make it. And we'd spoken to a few people in the industry and they'd said that in particular Sky Sports News, that they weren't taking anyone on at present now without a journalism background. And it was a really big thing that they decided to do to change it up. And they want a serious journalist. So Sky was always a dream of mine. So I thought, well, this is it. You've got to do it. And I sucked it up um, a year of my life um, studying nonstop. But again, it was like what we were talking about earlier, Sam. We, you know, Whether you're passionate about it, it's fine. And I was passionate about it. So it wasn't like in school where you just... Oh, get me out of this classroom where I'm sat at the back throwing paper at people. I'm instead I'm the one right at the front of the classroom, teacher's pet, doing all my homework. Um, just like a massive geek, but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And honestly, um, Mitch, it was the best thing I could have done. It really was. It, it has changed. It's changed my life completely. This is Pitch Talks. I'm sure a lot of people can resonate with the situation that you found yourself in, you know, as we said about doubting whether this was the right move, you're at the stage of your career where you are getting work in presenting that you do enjoy, but you just always had something there that just wasn't, or not wasn't right, but just something that you wanted more. Perhaps there's also a big influence, like we said, with social media and external pressures, like that image that you're portraying to other people, like do they, will they look at you you know differently if you're already changing your career so early on so what advice would you give to those people who are you know perhaps they're in a career they want to change their career preferably going into the sports industry but they're worried about all these other little factors what would you say to them yeah great question well i actually did a um so i did a mini documentary series with discovery channel um last year it just got released this year recently and um one of the episodes we did was on mental health and actually a link between creativity and mental health and i was speaking to a doctor who was talking to me about social perfectionism and it's this this theory that we think other people think of us in a certain way now those people Probably don't. But we, in our minds, we think that they're thinking that. And this is a big problem. And this is a common problem and a common theme I've had speaking to a lot of younger people, speaking to people uh, my age as well, still go through struggles with social media and this strive for social perfectionism. It Ultimately, p- perfection does not exist. Right. Let that, let's be clear here. There's no perfect scenario. There's nothing that is perfect. So we shouldn't strive for perfection, so to speak, because we can't ever get there. But what you've got to do is make sure you don't cheat. You put in the hard work and you put in the graph. Now, the advice I would say is just ignore what anyone thinks on social media. Ignore your thoughts on what other people are thinking. Focus on what you're doing. That's the most important thing. You're number one. You're the priority. Do the work yourself. And as long as you're proud of what you've done and know that you've you've left no stone unturned, then that's all you can do. And that really is all that anyone can ask of anybody. And if you do that, though, success will come. But it's just about switching off those thoughts because it's tricky. It's really, really tricky. It's hard. Look, it, you know, I, I still see it. You know, when I'm looking, I'm still looking always at opportunities and speaking to people and you know, you go on Twitter and you see someone else and you go, oh, he's doing well. Oh, look at him working on this project, that project. We all question what we're doing, but all you've got to do is look at yourself and go, are you doing enough? And I, I, I almost guarantee 99.9% of the time you're not doing enough. Trust me, there's an element of luck and fortune. Of course there is, but there's always something more you can be doing. Now, whether that's reading another article a day, whether that's reading more books, whether that's studying more, researching more, practicing your trade, filming yourself more, uh, producing some segments, writing some scripts, whatever it might be, there is always something you can do. And that for me is always the key. You do that and you spend more time on yourself than worrying about what other people think you'll be better off. I think that's great. Some great personal advice as well as, as professional advice. I just wanted to see if there was anything that you've got goal wise, even if it's long term, that that you want to maybe tick off the, the sort of the career bucket list. A great question. I think I think you've always got to set goals. 
uh, always along the way. It doesn't have to be, you know, ridiculous ones. It can be really real achievable ones, or it can be some that are quite far out, but it's something to strive for. As I mentioned earlier, you know, Sky was always a dream. It was what I wanted to do. Um, so to be able to um, work on Sky Sports News was was just amazing it was it was great for me but yes there's got to be a next goal you know there's got to be the next step and for me it would I, I would love to have a regular show whether that's three four times a week something regular that I can build up and make my own um, can help produce it as well I would love the opportunity to do that as regards sporting events uh, traveling I'd love to I'd love to work on the Olympics I'd love to get anywhere where I can get out of this country and go, go somewhere. Australia, New Zealand would be all right. <laughs> I think everyone's like that now, aren't they? Just want to <laughs> get out of the country. <laughs> I think we are. I think we are. But yeah, look, I, I've, been, I've been lucky in, in my life to travel so much with work. I really have. And see some amazing places, meet some amazing people. Um, but yeah, any opportunity to travel, you know, whether it's a, a three-month trip, whether it's an Ashes tour, yeah, something like that would just be amazing to cover. Um, I, I think that's probably where my next goal is is sitting. And we'll see. We'll see. The hard work needs to continue and hopefully we'll get there. You never know. You're listening to Pitch Talks. You just mentioned there actually about some of the awesome experiences and some of the projects that you've been working on since, you know, well, before and after you finish your, your course. You know, I've got... A, uh, an idea here like some of the ITV entertainment show that you've been doing for six years working with UEFA and Kia for the Europa League campaign and then obviously reading some paper reviews on talk sport some awesome positions and opportunities there so now I'm going to put you on the spot looking back over these experiences what's been your greatest moment oh, wow god you have put me on the spot <laughs> Oh, the people before me didn't warn me about this. Oh, wow, <laughs> oh, wow, wow. wow. Um, oh, my greatest moment. Wow. Great question. I, I'd say one, I, I'll, I'll say one of them. I mean, getting the opportunity at Sky was, was pretty damn special. Uh, I would certainly... Certainly say, look, um, you know, I had, an, I had an interview, a screen test, to be given the opportunity to work on the transfer shows, which is, um, which was amazing. Um, it, it really was, it was, that was, I guess, the accumulation of a lot of hard work to get to. It felt great, but there was one job I did, I think in particular, and it was part of the uh, work with UEFA and Kia I did for the Europa League. And I originally, I was working for this company and I originally wasn't booked to be the presenter for it. And I'm not going to lie, it irked me. Right. I was really I was really annoyed and I was annoyed because I was working for the company uh, behind the scenes. I thought this was just perfect for me. I knew I could do a great job. Uh, I knew I could do the scripts and produce it as well. So I could help out a lot. But for various political reasons that I wasn't picked to do it. After a couple of episodes, they realized actually maybe James would be me. I would be right for it. And I got given the opportunity and I, I promise you, I've never worked so hard in my life uh, because I wanted to prove to them, yes, you did make a mistake. Yes, I am good at this. Yes, this is what I can do. But one thing I did with them that was that was great all round. It's, it's more like it's, it's not just the on camera stuff, actually. It's we we were doing this show and we we're traveling around Europe a lot for the Europa League. So we were looking at different clubs to go and visit. Now, one of the clubs popped up and it was uh, Austria, Vienna. Now, we didn't have a relationship with Austria Vienna at all. We had no relationship, no communication whatsoever. Um, so I went out of my way and I hunted down on LinkedIn people who worked at Austria Vienna. Honestly, must have sent seven, eight, nine messages and got a couple of replies and got put through to the right person, had a phone call, explained what we were doing, and they were so welcoming it was unbelievable. And not only did they invite us to the stadium to do their filming, they invited me to go to their training camp in Turkey to go and do some interviews with players to film them training and to be around the squad. Right. And they never let, usually media isn't really training camps. They're quite wary about, they like to have their moment and their time together. They opened the doors, they invited us down. And when I went back and told the bosses what has been agreed, they just couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe that we managed to do that. And I was so 
that was such a proud moment that shows the hard work, the graft, the research, um, and not being afraid to just connect with people and contact them and ask ask a question. That's the joy with LinkedIn now. And again, advice to anybody out there right now, use LinkedIn. It is so valuable because you can find almost anybody on there and anybody who is a decision maker within a company. And if not, they might point you in the right direction of one. And always, what's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen, they don't reply. No problem. You haven't lost anything. You're listening to Pitch Talks, bringing you the game. So far on Pitch Talks, we've been chatting with James Green, learning all about his first steps into his career, the early presenting gigs, and the all-important lesson into following your dreams, even if it means going back to education and learning. James, once again, you touched upon something that I now want to come on to, and that's the role that you're doing now as a reporter, mainly for Sky Sports. At the time of recording, you know, we're a couple of days away from deadline day. Probably one of the busiest times to be a football reporter, I can imagine, you know, with the transfer window and anything that could happen at any given moment. One of the things that we love most about Deadline Day, of course. You know, what does a typical day look like in planning for a Deadline Day? I'll give you an insight into, uh, certainly give you an insight into a year ago and um, when I when I first started on the show and how it would work is we would get in. So our show would be on... Was it nine o'clock last year or was it 10 o'clock? Might have been 10 o'clock. Um, we we're in at 6 a.m. Um, so four hours before we're in at 6 a.m. We have a meeting. We discuss what's going on, what stories are out there. Was there anything last night, late last night that came in that we would cover? So we'd all go around the table. We'd all obviously have had a look, hopefully, and maybe somebody's got a contact somewhere that's heard something else, or maybe someone's got an interview set up. Um, one of the guys on there, Mark McAdam, is great. He's got a good relationship with like Harry Redknapp. So he often would like, right, I think Harry's available. So we'd try and get Harry um, involved in the show. Um, so we'd do the prep from like six o'clock. There was two producers working on it uh, who did a fantastic job uh, scripting it all and give it, working out, right, this is what we're going to do. This In this section, we're talking about United. This section, we're talking about this player, et cetera, et cetera. While all that's going on, you've got a team of reporters and a news desk who are there out there gathering news, speaking to their contacts, ear to the ground. It's Honestly, it's a machine at Sky Sports. It truly is a machine until you're involved in it, until you sat there, you kind of don't realise. I guess we take it for granted. You know, we watch Sky Sports News, we just take it all for granted. What was funny, though, when I started it, and the amount of people that asked me, oh, let us know. If you hear anything, let us know. <laughs> I kept on saying to them, honestly, you will know when you see it on the screen. I will know when I see it on the screen. And literally, that is it. It doesn't go travel through the office first as soon as that news is in and it's verified it's up it's up on the screen mm -hmm. breaking news and that's it and then there'll be a reporter out who might be talking about it i mean it is just a machine how they work uh it really is a deadline day it's a lot of fun it, it's just there's a there's a real buzz about the place on deadline day uh you've got obviously reporters scattered about uh might be a bit trickier come lockdown time so uh, we'll have to see what happens this week but it's yeah on in the studio uh, again it might be different this year but last year there was such a buzz there's people everywhere we were we were having a meeting because all the meeting rooms are being reused we ended up having a meeting room in the kitchen but then we were filming some behind the scenes stuff while we were preparing i mean there was presenters everywhere jim white waddles in and it, it's just it's just a great feeling it really is and um and it's why not why not get excited about something like transfer deadline day let's be honest we know that a lot of it sometimes there's not much happening especially in january it's a little bit dull and then now in the summer people are starting to do their business a lot earlier but why not get a bit of excitement and i think for football fans it's it's great fun do you have your own network of sort of sky sources or is that other people and, and, and are you looking to sort of try and build your own network of contacts as well to try and, I don't know, help the, the machine as you, as you put it, uh, um, but also gain sort of a, a, a leg up as, as such? As a reporter, yes, 100%. You've got to try and 
try and get as many contacts as you possibly can um, and build those relationships. It's no point in just having someone's number if you actually haven't got a relationship with them to be able to call them out of the blue and say, oh, is anything going on? Um, it, it does require a lot of work. Uh, that's something certainly from a personal point of view, I definitely can improve on. Uh, I could definitely do more. I could definitely venture out more, speak to more people, get in touch with more people, try and build that network. Because, yet, yeah, obviously, yes, at Sky, they've got sources everywhere. It's, it's like I said, it's unbelievable. But their sources have all been built by for years and years and years of doing it. So, you know, within clubs, people change, personnel change all the time. So it's about build, building and forging those new relationships. Uh, so for me, it's look, a lot of it is looking back on, uh, my past, looking to see who I've worked with in the past, looking at my friend space as well. It's amazing. A friend of a friend might work for someone. I've one of my friends, uh, a good friend of my friend, is um, the goalkeeping coach at Norwich City. Uh, now we've been out a few times, so actually we're now we get on really well. But having built that relationship up, we I had a bit of an insight into some dealings at Norwich. So I got a few exclusives in certainly last year when they made a couple of signings towards the end. And I had a great night out with James Madison one once as well. Oh, uh, he's a good lad. I like him. <laughs> so things like that though, um, is, is definitely important. And for any, again, anybody who's aspiring to be a reporter, a hundred percent build that network base, build it as much as you can build those relationships. Uh, that is the best advice anybody could get because it will stand you in good stead moving forward. Last one from me on, on, on this subject. I believe you did West Ham's training ground on one of the, the transfer talk. Obviously, you must be glad that you now, majority of it takes place inside the training complex where you haven't got fans behind the cameras potentially waving objects that might be <laughs> a little bit non-PC, shall we say. But how does that differ from being in the studio, apart from obviously the location and everything, and the how quickly do you get news? Is it still the same process being fed to you from Sky or do you actually potentially go in and speak to the coaches and the players and, and et cetera? Yeah, great question. Um, do you know what? I'd love the fans to be there myself. I, I really would. I, I think that's part of it. And I think that's that's something that Transfer Deadline Day misses. I, I really, really do. I think the, the fans make it, maybe not waving certain objects behind, but... <laughs> It's 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 fun, and that's how transfer deadline day I think should be. It's almost where football, for twenty four hours, takes a bit of a break from being a serious business organisation. Actually, has a bit of fun. Uh, I, I really do, and I, I wish, I wish we get back to that, and I hope at some point we get back to that. I really do. Um, yeah, as regards to reporting, <clears throat> reporting outside is, it's very different. So, for example, I you know yeah I've got been sent to West Ham, Bournemouth, um, Arsenal, a bit. Tottenham all over the place really so with West Ham it might be a press conference so uh, I'll be there to do the press conference for David Boyes as it was last year um, and in that recording that you saw you do the, you often do before the press conference you'll do a bit to camera and you'll do a piece about uh, current state of West Ham what you're looking to find out from David Moyes today uh, and then sometimes after the press conference either they'll bring you the press conference or you might do a piece afterwards about what he said but it all requires preparation you know because if you what what I find fascinating always did find fascinating when you look at Sky Sports News and look at these reporters on camera they never make a mistake. They're just like flow, 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 flow. No arms, no arms. And I was fascinated by that. And what it was and the key is, is because they all prepare. They all prepare their script. So, for example, I go down to West Ham and I'm on, on the train on the way or I spend the morning. I'm sat there going, right, I know what's coming up. This is what I want to say. And I'll prepare a script and I'll write a script for myself. And then you just run it over in your head. So it's in your head, you know the flow, you know what you've got to talk about, and that's it. And then you deliver it to camera. Uh, so, And then if there is any breaking news as such, then usually someone will pop in your ear unless you've heard something while you, you're there and thereabouts. Because bear in mind, certainly at press conferences, there, there could be 20, 30 different journalists from different organisations who have contacts everywhere. And you all talk, so you all, you all kind of know what's going on. Uh, so, look, it's... The main thing is when you're in those situations, just it's build relationships with the other journalists as well, because they're really important because they might share information with you as well moving forward. So, yeah, it's all about building relationships. It really is. This is Pitch Talks. I'll penultimate question for you, James, and I'm, I'm afraid it's probably going to put you on the spot again. 
But I only say that because just from talking with you today, I can just see how passionate and enthusiastic you are about what you do and what you have done. So that's what will make it quite tricky. But what do you love most about what you do? I prefer this one, Mitch, if I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the buzz. I love the buzz. I love the excitement. Uh, I was having this conversation with my girlfriend yesterday, actually, um, and I was doing some other work away from sport. And I was finding it really tough to concentrate. And then my phone rings and I have some sport to do and some uh, a report a report to prepare. And I just get this energy and this uplift and, and, and this enjoyment. And uh, like, for example, tomorrow I'm interviewing a uh, former rugby league player who's now a Hollywood actor, right? Love it. Love hearing the story. So I love researching his story, where he's come from, his career as a rugby league player to where he is now. Uh, and I just got this huge buzz from it. And it's just doing stuff that you're passionate about. That's what I love about it the most, without a shadow of a doubt. So earlier on, you gave your words of encouragement to those people looking to change their careers. But what would be great to round up what's been an awesome episode is if you could provide any final piece of advice for those who are perhaps looking to get into sport, uh, presenting, reporting, or just trying to achieve their dream job. What would you say? First thing I would say is work harder than the next person. I, I would start with that. Um, I do a lot of talks uh, when I go to UCFB as well, quite a bit. Um, not as, so much at the moment because of the current situation, but that's the first thing I always say is work harder than the next person. Because certainly in sport, if you don't, somebody else will. And the one thing we were talking about earlier about you know going to, going on social media and seeing what other people are doing, you can always see those who are really on it, those who know so much more about their subject. And the reason why they know so much more, because they're working harder and they're researching harder and they're reading more. And that's where you've got to be. You've got to set yourself apart from somebody else. Uh, and I'd always encourage people to ask themselves, what, what's their differential? What makes them different and better than somebody else? And what sets you apart? And that's so, so important. And you've got to have that. Um, now, again, I mentioned it before. The advice I would give is you've got to train. You've got to train on what you do. You know, whether you're a reporter, whether you're a presenter, if you think about like actors or singers, singers don't just go on stage and sing. They do all their training. They constantly are in the studio rehearsing. They're doing all that. It shouldn't be any different for a reporter or a presenter. Uh, anybody on screen is exactly the same. Uh, and the fact is, like I was mentioning earlier again about YouTube, you've got YouTube. You can film your own series. You can do interviews. You can interview your friends. And all it is is about is working on your interview technique, working on how you prepare for the interview, how you deliver the interview, how you follow up the interview. It's all these key things that there are always something you can do. And I've had so many conversations with people in the past where they go, oh, just, I'm stuck. I've done, I've done everything. I've phoned this person. Oh, I've done everything. And then I could sit there and list about 20 or 30 different things that I haven't even thought about. And it's, is that you've just got to turn every stone. I think I love that term, but you've got to, you have to try and find a way to make it work. Uh, and I think it's really important, but ultimately it all, all comes down to hard work. And if you, you want to ask me what my biggest regret in life is not working hard enough when I was younger, because it, I'm 36 now, goodness me, uh, 37 in a couple of months. And if I knew this, and had that advice or had somebody tell me that when I was 20, 21, or even younger, I know that I'd be in a much better position now because I'd have worked so much harder. Um, and it's just so important. But put in the graph, put in the hard work, um, don't give up. And also, if you have opportunities to do volunteering work for a station or uh, any freelancing work like that, then do it on a CV. It looks so good. I can tell you it looks so good. I've interviewed people for jobs before, young people who have come in and a standout from someone who's maybe got their own YouTube channel, got their own Twitter account, got a fan channel, uh, have spent six months work experience at somewhere. It makes a huge difference. So I'd always encourage young people to do that. James, we've really enjoyed talking with you today. I think there are things or so many things that you've touched upon that people will take away from this chat, especially around the encouragement about it's never too late, the hard work. And like I said, 
when we're talking with you and you're sharing your experiences, the passion and we can just see how much you enjoy what you do. So once again, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your stories and providing some awesome insight. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks, Sam. Uh, love what you guys are doing. I think it's, uh, it's fantastic. Uh, keep it going. Thank so well you. Well done, guys. Thank you. So today we've been chatting with James Green, learning about his career into presenting and reporting, preparing for transfer deadline day, and what steps you can take to begin a similar career. If you've enjoyed today's episode, make sure you leave us your feedback or give us a follow on any of our social channels. So thank you for listening to Pitch Talks, the sports career podcast focused on helping you get into sport. Thank you for listening to another episode of Bringing You the Game by Pitch Talks. For more information on our latest episodes, careers advice, or to even get involved as a guest, get in touch with the team at mitch at pitch-talks.com. That's mitch at pitch-talks.com or send us a message on any of our social media platforms. Thanks for tuning in. Bringing you the game. Bringing you the game. Pitch Talks. All Pitch Talk content is copyright protected. Pitch Talks.